Okay, now, if you look at the slide, uh, we are talking about uh, positive duties. Uh, okay, now, uh, a crucial difference that Poggy makes over here is that, well, most of us and if we would recollect from the last article that we talked about, uh, when Singer also made this notion of supererogatory acts, that acts of charity or acts of uh, assistance from the affluent is a matter of uh, 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 praise. It should be praised, because it is an act of charity or supererogatory acts, acts which are not required. Now, uh, Poggi too fine, fine tunes this distinction, a commonly held uh, belief or uh, moral belief that well, it is an act of charity that well, when an affluent uh, nation uh, contributes to a uh, lesser affluent or a uh, underdeveloped uh, nation. But, uh, he tries to, Poggi tries to show that the existing world uh, poverty manifests a violation of our uh, negative duty. So, our duty is not to harm. So, what he is basically saying is that, well, uh, positive duties are duties that you ought to do, and there is nothing wrong if you do not do it. But, negative duties is our commitment not to create harm, which is therefore, uh, more minimal and therefore, much stronger as more foundational. That after the uh, uh, completion of negative duties, uh, positive duty, uh, duties may be uh, reward worthy or praise worthy, but negative duties are almost seen as a uh, necessity or as, as compulsorily um, to be performed. So, uh, removing world poverty is does not belong to this notion of positive duties, but to the very fundamental na uh, nature of negative uh, or uh, fundamental nature of negative duties, that is our duty is not to harm. So, uh, 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 Poggi does not talk about positive duties. Uh, tackled here. He, uh, he does not tackle it in this paper. In fact, he does not find uh, alleviating world poverty as something, uh, which belongs to the domain of positive duty. Rather, it uh, belongs to our duties not to harm. So, it is not that, when the affluent are assisting the uh, poor, that it is an act of charity to be uh, praised, but that it is uh, something that has to be necessarily done by uh, the affluent. And let us go into the genealogy, why he holds such a view. Well, to first he regards regards uh, the positive uh, the negative duty stronger than the positive duty. So, gives an example that the duty in the third bullet, the duty not to assault people is more stringent than the duty to prevent such assaults by others. And having assaulted another, the attacker has more reason to ensure that his victim's injuries are treated than a bystander would. So, Poggi makes a very binary stance here, that well, analogically. So, uh, uh, when he says that, the duty not to assault people is more stringent than the duty to prevent such assaults by others. Uh, and having assaulted another, the attacker uh, has more reason to ensure that his victim's injuries are treated than a bystander would. So, first that poverty is not, uh, the affluent are not a bystander to the whole uh, game of poverty coming into existence. That the affluent, as he shows, are directly responsible for the poverty that comes um, to different nations. And he tries to prove that. And therefore, having caused this poverty, the affluent owe duties of reparation to the uh, uh, underprivileged, because it is direct, uh, it is it is an a harm done by the world's rich onto the world's poor. And therefore, the world's rich are required to compensate for this harm that has been done. And so, uh, before we go into that uh, Poggi's claim, what is this, uh, let us tackle a little bit about this notion of negative duty being stronger than positive duty. So, how do you um, associate that, but uh, would you like to dispute that, or as negative duty as uh, uh, stronger than positive duty? Means to me, you know the example that he gives, in which he says that um, if you are a bystander, then you do have a duty to prevent an assault on somebody by a third person. But if you are someone directly engaged in that assault, then the uh, moral responsibility is greater. So. Um, I think, well, before I go into this, I, I, I would like to uh, disagree with you on the understanding of positive duties itself. Um, it seems to me that you understand positive duty 
completely as uh, super arrogatory acts as ch- acts of charity but i think um, they are they are to be understood properly as duties moral obligations and uh, even in singer when he when he says that we can't maintain the distinction between duties and super arrogatory acts what he is really saying is that so called super arrogatory acts are also to be considered acts of duty so uh, he expands the realm of positive duties but he only tackles with positive duties acts that one is morally obligated to perform um and i think that so he doesn't go so for him the af- on a superficial reading of his article it seems that for him the affluent citizens of the world are mere bystanders in the world event of poverty he doesn't go at all into the roots of poverty and the role that the affluent play in causing and maintaining that poverty okay. uh, but pogge's approach is completely different and um he shows how uh, the affluent are not just bystanders but active agents and participate pa- participants in that event so uh that being the case the affluent being directly involved in bringing about that harm and in maintaining it they have so th- if you talk about their duties concerning that event or that situation it can no longer be seen as a simple positive duty it has to be understood as a negative duty not to harm because they are involved in co- causing that harm in the first place and it also has to be understood as an intermediate duty to prevent future harm from something some action that they have performed in the past so i think pogge's analysis of the situation is um it's deeper than singers okay he goes a step ahead and finds this uh, because when he says that well uh, negative duty is making this uh, uh, concept that well that is something that has to be done if you have to have a uh, 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 a moral existence uh, yeah and you know if you don't um, if you don't analyze the role of the affluent in um, in world poverty then then you cannot go, uh, what basis do you offer for for their moral duty to interfere in that situation and to alleviate it you can, you cannot go beyond saying that uh, on the basis of a shared humanity they have to the pull of such a claim is not as strong as the pull of when he understands it uh, or when he uh, 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 understands it in terms of a negative duty so yes. just as uh, i am not ab- obliged to perhaps so strongly to help a bystander but i am definitely more uh, required not to harm a bystander so uh, uh, so when when uh, tackling global poverty uh, pogi pulls down this tackling of global poverty from a positive duty to a negative duty that is it is uh, 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 a requirement not to create harm and global poverty is a result of a failure of this negative duty so even in our inaction uh, uh, what m- many of us would like to think as our inaction or uh, our uh, choosing not to be more human than we are uh, pogi's downright claim is that well we uh, uh, tackling global poverty comes under the duties of reparation it is a wrong that has already been done and it has to be uh, uh, undone or compensated so that way it is uh, uh, an attack just as the analogy he presents that it is a negative duty because the attack has uh, by uh, you have attacked a by uh, stander and thereby you are more uh, obliged than anybody else to compensate uh, and also you continue to attack them through right. the socio political institutions that you help me in fact yes he puts out the world economic order as uh, that way so well uh, a negative duty does come out stronger than positive duty positive duty does uh, uh what singer does is he uh, tries to fuse supererogatory acts into duties that they are no more praiseworthy that they are essential yeah. duties perhaps uh, uh, uh poggy is uh, a layer uh, stricter and he further this uh, reduces it to that uh, these acts are not only uh, 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 a part of what one should they should not be praiseworthy but they are expected to be done it goes 
one step further and says that these acts are acts of reparation. So these are necessary. So these are like the repayment of a loan. They are no more uh, an act of charity that needs to be praised. So duties of reparation are much stronger than charity. So here, whatever assistance or whatever means for uh, alleviation of global poverty is talked about, they are uh, uh, duties of reparation and they are definitely much stronger than charity and definitely not an option. So how the wealthy, now of course this stands on the question that well how the wealthy are morally related to poverty. Uh, this is not a case for charity but for negative duty as Poggi puts it. But what makes, now Poggi goes on to explain that why it is a part of negative duty that how the wealthy are responsible for the poverty that comes across. And this is uh, when he claims that the wealthy are responsible for sustaining the macro order that benefits and perpetuates from inequality. Hmm. So uh, what uh, th this is almost a contestable, this is the most contestable claim that Poggi puts out that well many of the uh, world organizations would count on humanity as the pull hmm. for assistance whereas Poggi puts it out that well the wealthy are responsible for sustaining the macro order that benefits and perpetuates from inequality. So here inequality is not uh, a random event, but right. it is a very, very uh, caused event and the cause of which is the uh, cornering of the resources of the world to uh, the affluent and thereby at the cost of the, the uh, at the cost to the uh, poor. So this is where many, many uh, macro order theories would differ from Poggi. This is uh, a very crucial claim uh, on which Poggi's uh, uh, entire argument uh, hinges upon. Uh, one of the claims that I can see immediately is that, well, the theory that uh, first wealth is not, uh, the world view that wealth is not a finite uh, f uh, amount in the world and wealth can be generated. It is not that to make one person uh, or to make an, uh, a region wealthy, it has to be at the cost of another region. Now, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, so an argument could be that well wealth is definitely not created by cornering it out of another uh, region another strain of argument could be that the wealthy are wealthy because of their uh, thrift because of their effort because of their uh, efficiency and the poor are poor because of the lack of these uh, qualities exhibited now uh, there have been very strong critiques of uh, poggi's claim over here that which to them has uh, made a very black and white interpretation that all wealth is cornered out from uh, poorer regions to wealthier regions and uh, there is no uh, factor uh, given to uh, human effort and human thrift and human uh, the human uh, element in creation of wealth where uh, and wealth is simply seen as a transfer of resources from one part to the other. Uh, you would have some uh, views on this. We have discussed this mm. while discussing Singer. Mm. Right now, what comes to my mind is that that a human enterprise is important, but um, you know, hu human enterprise needs a conducive environment to thrive in, and. Uh, and that is where the, the macro order comes into the picture. It's, one can reasonably ask if, if, um, if an enterprising person would have the same amount of success in, uh, in a developing country as she would in a developed country. Uh, the odds that she has to battle against in a developing country would be so much higher. Right, okay, this is taking on uh, Poggi's strain that well, um, uh, even if human enterprise has to be valued, it has to be valued only uh, uh, if, if we have a, a common fertile ground for it to prosper. And this macro order does not allow for that uh, even uh, a parity uh, between uh, these common grounds where human enterprise has to uh, can prosper and therefore this macro ad order becomes so uh, so essential um, and so overpowering that it dominates over the 
presence or absence of human enterprise. It makes it almost futile. Okay, now we talk about uh, the uh, ecumenical approach that uh, Pogi takes again to uh, bring forth this very claim that he talks about. Yes, you know, but uh, one does also think about the the uh, those individuals in the developed country who have risen up the economic ladder by dint of their own hard work and enterprising spirit and um, if you go to i mean their case is very different from the case of the big ceos and business tycoons if you go to them a, a person who has started out as a factory worker and then gone on to you know make a very successful career if you talk to such a person and say that uh, your success is not a result of your own efforts but of uh, this uh, the socio economic institutions in your country that uh, that benefit its own citizens at the cost of citizens elsewhere i i don't know how convincing that argument would sound to that person but but it may also be a case of that person conveniently not taking that bigger picture into account and selectively deciding to focus on their own efforts right and perhaps at the first uh, uh, encounter with such a question this person would be uh, would feel wronged that his entire effort is being reduced to right. just a, a fertile uh, macro system around him but uh, or her but the, um, perhaps if i may be allowed to rephrase that question and if you ask that person that would she be able to achieve the same level of uh, uh, that she has achieved in a different macroeconomic uh, or macro social order and that would perhaps uh, bring out the role that uh, uh, apparently inert socio economic or the macro system around uh, an agent plays in uh, in the flourishing of that uh, individual so yes uh, it's 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 almost a statistical correlate that uh, uh, most of the best uh, 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 say say uh, students come out from most of the best schools and it is only a thin uh, uh, segment of outliers where there is an exception that well uh, worse off schools uh, bringing out better off students it's yeah, a simple in the latter case the yeah. students are successful not because of that is an atmosphere but despite that that is an enormous tribute to uh, the power of human spirit that overcomes all odds against it but uh, uh, not counting the own, uh, outliers in making a policy that well uh, uh, it's almost like a, a deterministic setup that well uh, uh, people uh, or students who uh, uh, go to such a kind of a school will probably land up in such a kind of a profession whereas people who go to such a kind of a school uh, another kind of a school have uh, more probabilities of landing up in another uh, kind of a uh, profession of course human uh, uh, endeavor or en on uh, enterprise is not uh, uh, written off but uh, it only flourishes in a uh, environment and it requires enormous uh, uh, energy to flourish in an uh, unsuitable environment and it's also not the case that a suitable environment will bring out the best in everybody but yes uh, so uh, poggy's attack is that well uh, discounting the differences in human enterprise and potential and perhaps at a deeper level even seeing the uh, uh, differences in human enterprise and entrepreneurship as a result of the uh, um, macro structure in which one is raised where uh, uh, went is given for ideas to translate into reality and where uh, there is very little went and possibility for the idea for ideas to translate into reality that itself affects the uh, 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 this uh, the human uh, enterprise or entrepreneurship so in a way yes uh, poggy's essential claim is putting the macroeconomic uh, uh, or macro social the macro structure uh, before the individual uh, enterprise and thereof that becomes more fundamental than uh, human enterprise so when he talks about now this is another as as a paper in applied ethics there are certain uh, it stands on certain foundations and stilts uh, about theoretical ethics that it talks about and one of this is what he calls the uh, ecumenical approach so uh, 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 
traditionally we have been aware of theories and theories contradicting them and another theory coming up. So, um, an author's loyalty remains to a particular theory and there is an uh, argument against another theory by propagating uh, maybe a, a counter theory to it. But here, uh, uh, Poggy comes brings about almost like a uh, populistic or a universal appeal, a universal net cutting across all ideological uh, commitments. So, uh, he wards off the possibility of reading an ideology into his uh, claim and uh, he, he makes it, uh, uh, he pegs his theory on a single consistent baseline of, uh, he does not peg his theory on a single consistent uh, theory. In fact, it is, um, uh, he, he makes an appeal which can be seen across various theories. So, it is not particularly that he is arguing against the consequentialist theory or in favor of deontological theory, but it is almost an uh, theory that has a universal appeal cutting across theoretical or ideological commitments. Uh, so, he puts it, he explains it in this third section of his article when he talks about radical inequality. He puts out uh, uh, five basic uh, uh, observations uh, which are very empirical in nature and uh, but hardly would there would be uh, disagreement about these observations. The cause of these observations may vary. Uh, or the justifications of these observations may vary, but uh, these observations are fairly uh, generic and uh, empirical and uh, uh, fairly uh, well documented. Well, uh, first is that the worse off are very badly in absolute terms. They are also very badly off in relative terms, very much worse off than many others. So, it is not that in just in absolute uh, uh, terms that they are uh, doing uh, ill of that uh, the requirements of human existence are uh, lesser than uh, what are absolutely required, but he also points out that they are also badly off in the terms of the disparity between uh, the worse off and the better off. And uh, this inequality is impervious, so that the movement from uh, one segment to other segment is not as free flowing as it uh, ought to be this inequality is pervasive, it pervades a large region and uh, last of all his claim, uh, which is definitely not an empirical claim that this inequality is avoidable. So, uh, his uh, understanding of radical inequality uh, pegs on these uh, almost four observations and a fifth value claim, uh, claiming that this inequality is avoidable, because if these four observations are true, what it means is that there is enough resource to be uh, distributed uh, amongst all. So, in principle it is possible to have a, a lesser disparity and a higher uh, absolute uh, minimum standard and to allow mobility between segments. So, if these four observations are uh, accurate, then it is uh, obvious uh, that or it is logically uh, very obvious that inequality is therefore avoidable. Why do yes. you say he has a single consistent baseline? Uh, well, because he, he says he does not. He does not, yes. Uh, he is reacting to a single consistent uh, baseline. So, that there is no, in fact, uh, that way he is uh, anti reductionist. That is, mm -hmm. his theory cannot be reduced to one particular uh, theory of ethics. So, in fact, his approach therefore is more ecumenical because it is more catholic or more encompassing. Uh, human requirements and uh, uh, sensibilities than fro flowing from a uh, ideological commitment to a particular kind of theory. Mm -hmm. And therefore, he tackles various theories at uh, various levels. Now, he talks about uh, engaging in the fourth part of his article, he talks about engaging historical conceptions of social justice. And now, this brings about the genealogy that how he thinks that well social justice is not a matter of uh, is, is not an option, but is almost a necessity because of historical uh, wrongdoings. Uh, the social positions of the worse off and the better off have emerged from a single historical process that was pervaded by massive previous wrongs. So, uh, now this is the beginning of a world view of which this article's claim is a uh, applied conclusion to it. So, the view being 
that well the social starting positions that how people start off both the worse off and the better off have emerged from a single historical process that was pervaded by massive previous wrongs. So, uh, the poor and the rich did not evolve out of different processes at different uh, places and therefore, they are not independent or innocent bystanders to each other's position. Rather, they are the product of the same process and therefore, there is a very close connect between the worse off and the better off because they have evolved or emerged from a single historical process that was and this historical pr uh, process is pervaded by massive and grievous wrongs. The most obvious uh, example from the Indian tradition could be the colonial legacy that well the colonization of a, a nation has completely stripped the resources of a nation into a more prosperous nation and this moral accountability has to be extended over generations. Now, these are very two very foundational claims that Kogi here is making. One is that they belong to a single historical process. He is seeing the entire world order as a single historical process of which uh, the wealthy and uh, uh, the worse off and the better off, the wealthy and the poor are mere offshoots. Therefore, one is connected to the other because the other way of looking at uh, uh, the other world view at the same position would be that uh, different cultures which developed independently of each other have their own have had their own enterprise uh, flourishing into bringing about uh, affluence or the lack of it bringing about penury. But uh, Poggi makes it very uh, clear his claim being that it is a single historical process that was uh, of which the poor and the rich are offshoots. And secondly that this moral accountability that this poor and rich uh, or the wealthy and uh, poor were uh, a process of a uh, where, where offshoots of a single historical process and therefore, their uh, uh, succeeding generations owe moral accountability to the same. Now, this is a very crucial uh, claim because uh, uh, how does one extend moral agency over individuals. In fact, this is the claim of moral agency being extended over uh, generations mm -hmm. that uh, uh, from from various uh, if, if this is uh, held as an uh, uh, guiding principle then uh, having moral accountability over generations would almost uh, uh, naively put or simplistically put read about um, punishing the uh, coming generation or rewarding the succeeding generations for the acts of uh, preceding generation now uh, this seems to be two very dominant uh, views world views that or uh, foundational views that uh, uh, Poggi hinges his uh, claim upon, but which are nevertheless quite uh, debatable and disputable. So, this uh, the author reads this historical context as so uh, strong and horrendous that there ought to be an ecumenical, uh, ecumenical agreement on just entitlement. Uh, the rich have to have a uh, catholic holistic agreement for the affluence that has been cornered into their parts of the world as uh, sourced from you know, which is which are now the poorer parts of the world and there just has to be an agreement on just entitlement. So, what about uh, before we proceed uh, let us just explore this notion of moral accountability over generations. Now, uh, if, if this is a guiding principle at one hand uh, for uh, making do or, or undoing the, uh, the the exploitation or the cornering of resources that had taken place uh, that had been yeah. taken place by one generation then it what also you know, opens up yeah one here's objection being voiced against this claim this tenet uh -huh. of morality uh, in the indian context as well in relation to the reservation policy uh -huh. uh, the individuals, some of the individuals belonging to the so called upper caste um, argue that uh, since they themselves were not responsible in creating the unjust caste order and the resultant deprivations, why should they have to suffer in order to rectify the wrongs. Um, but one thing that comes to my mind in response to that objection is that uh, we have to recognize that the the inequality or the uh, 
regime of deprivation and discrimination is far from over. We haven't left it behind in the past. Be it uh, the caste system in India or the, um, the pervasive poverty and inequality in the world, or the uh, colonial and imperialist regime which creates that inequality. It's not over, it's not a thing of the past. Imperialism continues to shape the world. So, but it may have reinvented it, it may present itself in new avatars. So the first thing is to recognize that the source or uh, the system of deprivation continues in some form. The second thing I think, uh, the second thing to recognize is that uh, even if we are not personally involved in, in holding up that system, we are its beneficiaries in some way. So, um, well, reverting to the Indian situation again, uh, if I'm an, a so-called upper caste person, but uh, I personally believe in equality of all human beings and I don't engage in any discriminatory act against anyone, even then, just um, just because I was born in this upper caste situation, I have reaped some benefits of that situation. I have been tr uh, treated differently in society. I've had a, a differential sort of access to resources, not just material resources, but also cultural resources, which, which ultimately put me in a better situation in life. So, if and you know that uh, the advantage that all those factors have given me are not a result of my own individual effort. So I can't um, I can't say it, it's all earned by merit, personal individual merit. If I recognize that, then I'll also recognize my duty to uh, to. Uh, compensate for the um, corresponding disadvantage that other people have suffered due to similar factors. Did I complete my sentence? Yes, yes. In fact, perhaps uh, Pogi couldn't agree more because this is the same kind of a justification that uh, he proposes that, well, if one is responsible or one is benefiting from uh, the results of an unequal distribution that uh, took place in preceding generations. So one ought also to be responsible for the duties of reparation that uh, stuck along with the unequal distribution that started in the preceding generations. So yes, moral accountability over generations only if and even uh, very well uh, put in the Indian scenario that uh, positive or affirmative action uh, finds, its justifi finds its justification that because one, this generation may not be discriminating as the earlier uh, generations. but this generation does benefit from the advantage that the earlier generations got out of the discrimination. And therefore, when this advantage is inherited, the responsibilities for the just entitlement, as Poggi puts it, also are inherited. So for Poggi, this moral accountability of our generations uh, finds its justification in uh, this kind of a claim that uh, if we do benefit from inequality, how much ever in the preceding uh, generations that it took place, that took place, uh, we also therefore inherit the advantage and therefore the responsible f responsibility for a just entitlement or the duties of reparation that we have. So, uh, next, Poggi's uh, claims that argues against the fictional notion of history that claims that any distribution, however skewed, could have been the outcome of a sequence of voluntary bets or gambles. Now, yes, here he is. Uh, alluding to those people who would like to critique the historical processes as uh, uh, various or several processes where uh, uh, cultures or generations in cultures took decisions or sh showed lack of thrift and therefore landed up in the poverty that they landed up in or the other way around landed up in the affluence that they landed up in. So, uh, such a fictional notion of uh, history that claims that any distribution uh, uh, however skewed could have been the outcome of a sequence of voluntary bets or gambles, just as the way 
uh, even today perhaps giving an analogy to this situation is that well uh, the wealth or the uh, lack of it that a person uh, lands up in is a result totally of uh, his or her own uh, good or wrong or right choices now this also perhaps uh, Poggy would not agree because this also depends on uh, the kind of uh, macro order that these two individuals have been exposed to. So, just as it is uh, uh, it's very much possible that well uh, chil uh, or children in the Indian, Indian scenario from the underprivileged background uh, are highly likely to be schooled till a lower level and thereof highly likely to take up employment at a uh, semi-skilled level, whereas uh, children of the privileged classes uh, are highly likely to uh, uh, be exposed to better schooling and thereof highly likely to uh, um, land up in more skilled employment and therefore more affluent lifestyles. So these seem to be, uh, 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 this, this seems to indicate a problem in the macro system, not just a result of the individual decision making. So maybe three fourth of the people languishing in Indian prisons uh, t uh, come out from the uh, lowest income groups. So Poggi's very uh, uh, systematic claim is that this three fourth is not because these three fourths of these people uh, 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 of the people in the prisons are belong to uh, the, the uh, underprivileged classes or lower income groups because they all took wrong decisions. It is because the macro order is such that. Uh, uh, that that uh, almost uh, mm -hmm. determines them to take uh, decisions which they would have not taken. So, uh, putting it totally on voluntary putting one's position or uh, taking full uh, uh, or assigning full responsibility for one's uh, pos position in socio-economic order to one's own decisions irrespective of the uh, macro milieu in which one is raised seems to be untenable according to Poggi. So, uh, in fact, he goes on to appreciate Locke when he does his historical uh, extrapolation, because we uh, theoreticians want to extrapolate to understand why the way th uh, things are. The first and uh, the most obvious uh, way is to extrapolate. So, uh, he finds well with Locke's extrapolation. Uh, he says that well, a fictional extrapolation of history can be plausible only if the participants rationally agreed to the contract. So, he puts it forth, well, he talks about uh, the social contract theory uh, and he talks about well the justification for the contract theory is that well all, when all the participants rationally agreed to uh, the contract. So, if we take a uh, process of uh, colonization, so uh, uh, Poggi would say that well uh, this is colonization uh, uh, or the uh, colonial spread can can be seen as, as a, a conscious process which resulted in this unequal distribution of resources only if all the participants rationally agreed to the contract. So, any extrapolation has to give that much of credibility to the agents that uh, in principle they would have rationally agreed and uh, that filters out a lot of uh, historical claims that uh, uh, seem to justify inequality as a uh, result of uh, individual decision uh, individual decisions. The present world is characterized not merely by radical inequality as defined, but also by the fact that the better off enjoy significant advantages in the use of a single natural resource base from whose benefits the worse off are largely and without compensation excluded. So, uh, it is a very powerful claim made that well the present world is characterized not merely by radical inequality as defined. But the fact that the better offs enjoy significant advantages in the use of a single natural resource base from whose benefits the worse off are largely and without compensation excluded. So, in fact, this goes ahead. Uh, in fact, I could uh, surmise that we uh, even uh, question property rights right from what uh, the claim Poggi is making over here. Say, for instance, let us take something like a single natural resource like potable water. Now, in a same uh, transposing this uh, claim of uh, uh, Poggi into say an uh, Indian scenario, we can find that well in the same city, there is better quality water in the bathtubs and the flush tanks of uh, people and for uh, the same uh, quality of water people have to wait for a ferry 
uh, long time and have a very difficult access to the uh, same level of uh, water. So, Boggy unequivoc unequivocally puts it off, puts it up that, well, this significant advantage that the better off enjoy is not any uh, coming from any parallel uh, natural resource, but it is the single same natural resource from whose benefits the worse off are largely and without compensation excluded. So, something like uh, uh, potable water. Now, uh, there is a single natural resource and if it, uh, if it can water the lawns or uh, uh, land up in the bathtubs, it is landing up at a cost and the cost is borne by uh, the worse off who do not, who are prevented from accessing that water and there is no compensation for the same. In fact, this is uh, almost a clarion call against the commercialization of the distribution of natural resources. So, uh, any natural resources that uh, a society is endowed with, to commercialize it and therefore, uh, distributing it according to uh, one's commercial ability or requirement uh, against uh, one who is not commercially uh, uh, capable enough to acquire it. Is is more than radical inequality. It is, uh, it is uh, even uh, the radical inequality model that uh, Poggi suggests is only mere in comparison to that. So, especially when it comes to natural resources, I the, the Poggi is pointing out that well, the significant advantages that the better off enjoy are at the cost of preventing uh, or at the cost of the worse offs who are uh, therefore prevented and without compensation excluded. So, uh, in fact, one can draw a lot of uh, applied uh, cases that occur uh, or that have occurred even in the Indian scenario. One that occurs to me is the, the PC culture or the shrimp business that took place in India a few decades back, which was largely outsourced from the West to uh, India and, and adjoining Asian countries, uh, because it did consume a lot of uh, water from the water table. And this water from the water table comes at a cost to the access uh, of water from the water table to the farmers in the uh, adjoining areas where these pisciculture uh, units uh, uh, started up. So, uh, a natural resource is clearly finite, even if uh, some theoreticians would like to propose that wealth is can be generated or can be created. In the matters of natural resource, there can be no such argument or ambiguity that natural resource is definitely a finite resource and that comes from any uh, allocation of it will definitely uh, or any distribution will definitely uh, be, be affect both the parties amongst or all the parties amongst which it is distributed. This distribution of natural uh, resources is definitely not innocent and uh, uh, the better off are responsible for uh, deprivation of the same natural resource to the worse off. If, if he goes on to say that if current inequality is justified as a consequence of the historical route, it falls short as the actual historical processes is populated with huge wrongdoings. The Poggi's claim is very clear here that well, the historical, uh, there can be no justification of inequality from the historical route. So, one does have to get into the history of the uh, world order to understand the uh, difference, different positions taken up. So, and he does find huge wrongdoings, wrongdoings in this uh, historical process. So, as it is, the citizens gov and governments of the affluent states are violating this negative duty when we, uh, where he means citizens of the wealthy or affluent nations in collaboration with the ruling uh, elites, uh, I think cliques. Cliques, uh, cliques of many poor uh, countries, coercively exclude the global poor from a proportional resource share and any equivalent substitute. So, here uh, this is the final accusation that Poggi makes is that uh, uh, citizens and governments of the affluent states and uh, the ruling elites of uh, many poor countries together sustain such a macro system, which corners away a disproportional resource uh, to a certain population and 
leaves very little resource or uh, for the uh, others who are condemned to poverty thereby and not also providing an equivalent substitute. Now, this is a problem or this is a claim that he is raised is faced in many societies in many uh, cultures about uh, uh, in various perspectives. So, we can have places like uh, uh, the building of in, in, in the Indian scenario there are uh, the buildings of dams of roads of uh, access to water by industry and uh, where commercial interests cl clearly come in conflict with the fair uh, distribution. So, Poggi's very uh, fun foundational claim is that well the, the macro order is such that uh, commercial commer the distribution of financial uh, power does not uh, f uh, reflect in fact far from uh, is uh, just it is in a downright unjust uh, the uh, ideally an economic system or a fi uh, financial system would uh, want affluence to be a representation of uh, human thrift ability enterprise and uh, the lack of it uh, a reflection of that, but uh, Poggi finds fault with that, that this distribution in uh, financial power is not caused by that particular generation rather it is uh, or, or by that particular individuals, but it is only a result of the macro order in which people are and therefore, uh, deciding on the basis of uh, financial ability or commercial ability. Uh, or using that as an indicator to or a parameter to distribute uh, uh, natural resources uh, is definitely unfair. So, uh, historical process uh, one has to look into the historical process and the historical process is flooded with wrongdoings and these wrongdoings need needs to be repaired. We cannot start at a zero baseline, we do have to uh, take a look at the uh, what made the baseline different for different people and therefore, we do have to have a uh, correction uh, in the baseline. So, th this is what he talks about uh, when he talks about engaging with the historical process.